Uh, all right. Nice that's oh, that's up to you, of course. Um, okay. So without further ado, today we have Mihalis Diplomos, oh. Professor of Mathematics at Princeton University, who's going to tell us about extremal and near extremal black holes. Sorry for the delay. Okay, so there's still one pen to the right. Uh, let me ah. see if I exit the screen and reach to it. This would be better. Um, the screen. Choose the dimensions. Okay, but now the dimensions seem to And maybe you can now. Right. Oh, yeah. and I will move this to the side. Uh, and we're okay now. All right, sorry everyone for the brief uh, delay. Uh, I think your infrastructure in Boston could. <laughs> it's a sore subject. I had no problem on the New Jersey transit. Um, anyway, so it's a pleasure to be here. My uh, title is Extremal and Near Extreme of my course. So let me begin the talk and tell you what I want to tell you. Oh, now this doesn't work. Ah, it does. So, uh, so here's the plan of the lecture very briefly. So I'm first going to tell you about the, sort of the sub-extremal stability story very, very briefly. And then I'm gonna pass into what I really want to talk about, which is extremality. So, um, so I'll talk about what I'll refer to in this talk as two dominant paradigms about extremality, which have sort of clouded all issues concerning extremality. And, uh, and somehow uh, one of the points of this talk is that we have to get past these paradigms. So that will then lead us to uh, sort of a stability conjecture for extremal black holes with a question mark reasons that should be clear. And then finally, I want to talk about uh, something um, upcoming, which I think is very exciting, namely this new um, example of extremal critical collapse due to Kayla and, and Unger and the new picture of, of phase space or the moduli space of gravitational collapse that, that this sort of suggests. Okay. So, and by the way, feel feel free to stop. Okay, so let's begin with the sub extremal stability story. Um, okay, so this is the Kerr family, Kerr's paper, um, Kerr metric that we all know and love it in Black Hole Initiative. Uh, and of course, this is a, a family, two parameter family of stationary axiomatic solutions, the action vacuum equations describes black hole space time if the parameters satisfy A less than equal to M. And, and of course, uh, A equals zero is the Schwarzschild case. Uh, modulus of, of A less than M, strictly less than M, is uh, what we call extremal. And when you have equality, um, this is the uh, extremal case. And, and of course, uh, this will be relevant later. This means that the so-called surface graph, which is tradition, uh, denoted kappa and um, associated with temperature in the analogy with thermodynamics, uh, this is this is equal to zero. And let's not forget, of course, that um, uh, there's also the case where uh, the modulus of, of, of A is strictly bigger than M. And this is, of course, a naked singularity space time. Okay, so this is the Kerr family. So um, so let me uh, review the sub-extremal stability story or its current, what we know about it currently. And I'll start with uh, the nonlinear stability of, of Schwarzschild. So uh, this is a theorem from a few years back now, joined with Holzegel, Lubinansky, and Taylor. I think Martin Taylor actually gave uh, several lectures about this here in the Black Hole Initiative uh, a few years ago. And, uh, and the theorem is simply that the, the Schwarzschild family, uh, so the special case when A equals zero, is asymptotically stable as a solution to Cauchy problems for the vacuum equations in the exterior of the black hole for the full expected set of perturbations with no symmetry assumptions. So um, why do I say for the full expected set of perturbations? Well, already you'll, you'll realize that, of course, the Schwarzschild is a, is a one parameter subfamily of a larger two parameter um, class, the, 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 um, the Kerr family. So, uh, so there's no way that the one parameter subfamily can be asymptotically stable in general. Um, so the, what, what actually you, the best you can expect is that uh, this is this is sort of stable modulo the curve family. Okay, so uh, so the way to see it, and we're actually going to see this later on in the talk because this will be relevant for my discussion of extremality, is that there's a um, finite co-dimension hypersurface in the moduli space of solutions, uh, which can exactly characterizes uh, 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 approaching Schwarzschild. 
Okay, so there's a finite co-dimension hypersurface in the moduli space passing through the Schwarzschild family, such that if you're on that, then you asymptote back to Schwarzschild, and if you're not, you don't. So that's that's the theory. What 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 is the topology that you use uh, to characterize stability? So, uh, so of course, okay, the, anytime we talk about, it's a very good question, because anytime we talk about these questions of dynamics, then you always have to sort of choose some uh, topology, you know, on the moduli space, if you like uh, terminology. Uh, and, well, there is some topology of suitable regularity. Um, ideally, of course, one would be thrilled if one could sort of lower the precise regularity assumptions and sort of, it's a little bit of a technical issue. Um, so what you should think is that, you know, if the initial delta, you know, in a suitably sort of high norm of regularity is sufficiently close to Schwarzschild, and you should also always remember that these norms are moreover uh, weighted at infinity, they, they penalize sort of energy at infinity, because otherwise, of course, even Minkowski space is unstable, right, you can send in things, you know, a little bit of stuff, but sort of from very, very far away and suitably sort of, um, uh, uh, sort of short, so that uh, you create the little black hole and things like that. So, so yeah, so all those things go into the, as you said, the definition of the topology of the motion space. Okay, well, actually, I'll, I'll come back to this statement exactly because it will be relevant to um, precisely formulate it later on when I want to talk about extremality. But you should really think that this is, you know, the, this is the statement for Schwarzschild in general that you want to. All right, so that's the nonlinear stability of Schwarzschild. So let me oh, but just to make sure I understand. So the, the the statement is that if you start with something which is a small, sufficiently small perturbation of Schwarzschild, yeah. you'll return to, but you're not going to return to Schwarzschild. You're going to return to Kerr. If, right? if 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 you lie on a co-dimension. I want to say one, but it, it, because of, if you know about the topology of moduli space, the right number is three. So if you, if you lie in a co-dimension three hypersurface in moduli space, you will return to short. That's the state. But there's okay, but but there's only there aren't um, there's no extra fields in here, right? It's just right. this is vacuum. This so is right. um, So. What are the perturbations that gravitational waves? But wouldn't you always? Ex I see. But gravitational waves can never be spherically symmetric. And you're saying that yes. Well, the, there are no symmetry assumptions in this theorem, and indeed, there's no in under spherical symmetry. There's nothing. This would be a trivial state. I see. So, so the space times you're describing are one where all the angular. The, the very unusual ones, the usual thing would be you would settle back down to Kerr. Yes, right? if, if you're not on this co-dimension of but, three hypersurfaces here. Now, also, you, you really mean short shell, not boosted short shell, right? Well, I mean, again, this is semantics in the sense that uh, sort of <laughs> boosted Schwarzschild is Schwarzschild in a different gauge. So, uh, oh, no, no, no. no. <laughs> if to physicists, things with different energy are not the same, right? They have to be. I mean, I, I, I claim this is an issue of semantics. Okay, I respectfully disagree. Okay. But but um, in, in quantum mechanics, you can take a superposition of things with two different energies and it's a different way. I mean, certainly in these proofs, which maybe I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. say a few words in just a second, you know, there you should, you should think that there is naturally a sort of an initial gauge and gauge which is sort of suggested by the initial data. Yeah, and yeah. there is a final gauge, which is in the, Reference frame of the Schwarzschild solution to which you perturb. Yeah. And so the in the reference frame, but the difference between the initial thing and the final thing yes. is something which we regularly measure. Is it, measure, is, is it we BMS regularly BMS. measure in experiments? It's a BMS transformation. I'm so not the, saying one doesn't measure it in experiments. Yeah. I'm just saying that sort of. And if if your question is is the final Schwarzschild in a yeah. different BMS frame, then let's say whatever BMS frame is uh, initialized yeah. in yeah. an initial data, then certainly the answer is yes. But I'm just saying that okay, that's it's so sort of canonically it's it, this is uh, this is approaching Schwarzschild and yeah. it is boosted with respect to your initial data. But okay, yeah, that's just the 
Okay. That's just a relation you, between the but, but, but you're particularly interested in the ones where you don't go off the curve. And that's this co-dimension three subspace. Yes, in the context of this theorem. And again, this, if you want, so I'll, I'll, this will be very relevant when we talk about extramal. Okay. All right. So let me just say a few words about um, the, the, the sort of prehistory of this, because of course, the, the study of stability of Schwarzschild goes back uh, to 1957 and a paper of my um, academic uh, grandfather, Johnny Wheeler, uh, together with, with Reggie. So that was the first uh, study of, of um, Stability in Schwarzschild. So, what they what they studied was uh, was mode stability. Now, one of the funniest things actually of this paper is if if you know if you actually study the linear theory, of the Einstein equations around Schwarzschild, one of the things that you should see is the Kerr solution because of course the, the linearized Kerr solution is is uh, sitting there in the linear theory around Schwarzschild. Well, uh, if you know this, of course, this is uh, still the See if I can add five years uh, before the discovery of the Kerr solution, and there is no hint of the presence of a Kerr solution in, in that paper. So this was one of the many missed opportunities. This is, in fact, I think, really how the Kerr solution should have been uh, discovered. And in fact, uh, I, th there is a sense in which one can even see the in inevitability of the Kerr solution if you study carefully the linear theory. So you could have even discovered the Kerr solution without computation, which for us mathematicians, unlike uh, some of you can really compute. Uh, it's, it's very clear. Okay, so um, yeah, that wouldn't have helped you solve that complicated nonlinear PDE, would it have? Just well, told you it exists, right? Maybe you have to find it with a computer. No, no, no. I, I claim that actually there's a there's an argument. Uh, it's my favorite undergraduate project that I've never found no, undergraduate to do. <laughs> 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 That's a sort of <laughs> you know, to prove the existence of the person <laughs> without writing it down. Anyway, um, okay. So, um, so in any case, there's been uh, there there had been uh, lots of work on on on, on linear stability, and what I want to emphasize is actually a a, a work that preceded this uh, with uh, with Holzegel and Wojtyanski, where we we uh, we proved the full linear stability of Schwarzschild, and actually somehow. This was the main difficulty in some sense. So the main difficulty of this is, even though this is a nonlinear theory, somehow the main difficulty is, is sort of linear state. And the, the, the reason that this statement took so long uh, to achieve was not because of difficulties which are truly nonlinear, it's because of linear. It's because the linear theory had not been completely understood. Okay, so there's lots of um, uh, other things uh, uh, listed here that I, do, I don't want to sort of mention explicitly. Maybe one thing I will mention is, is at the very end that there are analogs of this problem for, for positive cosmological constant. Let me not talk at all about the, the, the negative cosmological constant case because that's a whole different, very complicated story. But the positive cosmological constant case, in some sense, these issues are easier, but still certainly uh, non trivial. Um, and there's a nonlinear stability for very slowly rotating curve to see the result due to hints and bars. Uh, from again uh, several years ago. Okay, so um, so again, I no the proof of that theorem was sort of embarrassingly long, and I I, I do hope that um, we we will learn in this subject to be able to prove these things in a much more compact way. Yes, I didn't realize that was so late that the full linear stability of, yes. of Schwarzschild was, was yes, late. and I guess for Kerr the problem is the ergosphere, and you don't. Have a positive norm, or something. that's a, certainly a big additional well, issue, which I'll discuss. Yes. Why is it so hard in short? Well, let me. Uh, so maybe I'll 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 make some comments here, sort of to what what does linear stability mean? Netta has a question in the chat. Oh yes, I was going to. Oh yes, Netta. Uh, hi, Mahal. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. How are you? Okay, great. Uh, I'm doing well. How are you? Great. Um, so I kind of, I know you didn't really want to talk about ADS. I just have a very quick question, since I know you've done a lot of work on that subject. Um, so my understanding is that the the issues with understanding stability of Schwarzschild and ADS have to do with uh, null geodesics bounding, bouncing off of the asymptotic boundary. So if, but it seems to me that given the stability in flat space, you could presumably put the right set of boundary conditions on the asymptotic boundary to guarantee stability. Uh, is that correct? So it's certainly the case that um, if 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 you're willing, let's say, to um, pose absorbing boundary conditions at infinity, 
uh, then the story becomes more like the asymptotically flawed story. And okay, there is certainly, um, in, in some sense, you, you might even think from some points of view, e even easier than the asymptotically flawed story. Um, so that's certainly a, a, an, an interesting thing to study. And I think there, there, there are people studying. Mm -hmm. But of course, if, if, if you pose reflecting boundary conditions, it's very interesting. Of course, pure ADS uh, uh, space uh, is unstable with, with reflecting yeah. boundary conditions. And the jury is still out is exactly what happens in, in the black hole case. And I know there are several people working on that. And, uh, you know, it's sort of related to, um, it's, it's, it's related yeah. to issues of uh, weak turbulence for dispersive PD. It's, it's a very interesting problem. Jury is out, even in sort of model problems, let's say, when you're not even thinking about the gravitational perturbation, you're just thinking about sort of uh, scalar wave equations on, on those backgrounds. So, um, but yes, I mean the short answer to your to your original question is most certainly if if you put yeah so so is there like, do we do we understand that the minimal amount of energy that we need to have leak out in order to have the um, the ADS black holes behave essentially like the asymptotically flat black hole? I I certainly don't. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean if if sort of one wants to go that route of you know thinking exactly what. Uh, like, like fully absorbing boundary conditions, obviously they do it, but it seems to be overkill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so it's an interesting question. I, I certainly, I certainly don't know. So yeah. Uh -huh. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. So uh, right. So let me um, just say some takeaway lessons from the proof because no one wants to read or even look at that proof. Uh, <laughs> so um, so the, the main takeaway uh, message from from my point of view is that uh, nonlinear stability is, is is fundamentally a linear problem. Um, that's to say, if, if, if one actually understands well enough linear stability, then one can hope to prove nonlinear stability using tools of nonlinear analysis, which have been developed last century and, and sort of in, in PD community principle uh, known and loved. Um, there's a sort of a converse statement, I don't know, that <laughs> if you can't uh, prove nonlinear stability, then you haven't actually uh, completely understood the, 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 the linear theory. So, um, so there's a big but in this in this uh, uh, slide. Um, so you 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 do really need to understand well the linear theory. So in particular, uh, one one needs to be able to show sort of sufficiently fast decay for gauge invariant quantities. It's not enough to say that oh they they decay, but you know maybe very slowly, maybe inverse logarithmically. That in some sense, if anything, is would be a sign of nonlinear instability. Okay, that's sort of what happens actually in the, in the ADS. So you, you, need, you need sufficiently fast uh, decay. And then um, um, in particular, uh, in order to show sufficiently fast decay, you really have to um, understand well the geodesic flow, in particular, the, the sort of geodesic flow in a neighborhood of trapped null geodesics. Okay, so the, the photon sphere and the generalization of the photon sphere incur, you have to understand that well, it's geometry because its geometry affects the dispersive properties of waves. If you had stable photon orbits, then you would not have uh, inverse polynomial decay. You would have only logarithmic decay. It's exactly what happens in ADS. It's exactly why you can, in principle, have uh, instability. So, uh, so anyway, so you, you really need a, a, a quantitative statement about the linear decay. Um, moreover, um, very often, uh, in, in sort of the literature, um, okay, one, you know, there are, in, in linear theory, there are gauge, um, there are gauge invariant quantities that sort of completely parameterize the, the gauge invariant part of the solution. So you can say, well, okay, I'll, I'll just estimate, you know, I'll prove some stability for those. And that's all, you know, good, that's fine. But uh, unfortunately in the full nonlinear theory, um, it doesn't quite work like that because there's no way to decouple sort of uh, pure gauge invariant quantities from the rest of the system. So you always have to deal with sort of gauge dependent quantities. So you always have to pick some good gauge and in that gauge have a stability uh, result. Yes? Sorry, very, very naive, but is the statement that if we have linear stability, then we necessarily have nonlinear stability? Well, ideally, one day. One day we will figure out how to prove a statement like that. Okay, one day. All right. Um, of course, again, and I emphasize, you know, the linear st the, the linear stability that we have to have has to be sufficiently strong. 
So all these aspects that I'm talking about are actually aspects of the, you know, of the linear theory. Okay? So, um, so just to, to return to this point, you, you really have to know how to write sort of in some well-posed gauge, you know, the linearized, the full linearized equations and show sort of that not only the gauge invariant things are well behaved, but also the gauge dependent. Because in the nonlinear uh, theory, this will be coupled, like it or not. They're weakly coupled, which means that what you need to know about the gauge dependent quantities is much less than what you need to know about the gauge invariant quantities, but you need to know something. Yes. Oh, oh, I was never understand this very well, but are you in danger here of like, you put conditions on your linear perturbations that, that, were, that things uh, decay fast enough at infinity. And then, and you, then- You that always works. have to put that. If you don't put that, the, the stability- but How do you know, how do you decide what the right ones to put on are? Well, I mean, again, the sort of, if, if Again, if it, it, it's it's certainly interesting to find the sharp result, okay. Yeah. But uh, I mean, I, I assure you, if you don't assume any, you if know, fall off, anything, then we'll this this result is false, and it's yeah. already false in the case of Minkowski space. So that's to say, if if you you can have very you know. So there was a whole story at GR which you're very familiar with about which about assuming fall-offs, which were too strong, and then you have these peeling here. Yeah, but okay, but I should so, say, yeah, but this is not, this is not sensitive to that. that that's to say that, that the- um, People prove theorems that didn't, didn't apply to physically interesting situations, right? How, how do you know that, how do you decide whether you're- That may be the case about people in general, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, but the claim is that sort of the, um, that threshold, let's, and, and I'm very, very interested in, you know, issues of, let's say, the, uh, the physical interpretation of obstructions to peeling. And um, actually, I, I, one of my uh, former students, uh, Leonard Kerberger, has a beautiful series of papers about that, which I really recommend for that issue. But, um, but the claim is that that's not, um, that's sort of not the threshold that plays a role here. So what, what you should think, in other words, is that in principle, these results should be true with even weaker assumptions than what anyone would ever think is sort of the right yeah. thing. So, uh, so it's not, that's to say, issues of, let's say, lack of peeling uh, well, will not mess up these, these types of things. So that's the point. Um, that, that's not to say that what's what's in the literature is the you know is the sharpest result, or that in in the literature certain things make assumptions that you know ideally one shouldn't make. But my claim to you is that that's it, this is not a fundamental issue for the, this problem. That's to say the the threshold of when you lose stability because you know the decay is not fast enough is very very far from the relevant right. sort of thresholds between, you know, sort of what, what are the right asymptotics for, for you know, that correctly um, encode uh, the past history of, of, of an isolated system. I have a question. On yes. Here. Just so I understand the statement of nonlinear stability a bit better. Yeah. So on the previous slide, you said that for the Einstein Maxwell system, uh, I don't think I ever had a scalar system. I didn't, I think I just had Einstein vacuum. So uh, okay. vacuum. So if you have a, just a scalar field, uh, which is minimally coupled to Einstein gravity, so you just look at scalar perturbations on, on Schwarzschild, let's say, uh, would you then expect to have nonlinear stability proof with such matter content as well? You can you can also add the scalar field if you want to these theorems. I mean, that's not a... But the, the thing is, we also know that there is a Weimann or a Janus Neumann Winnicott type of naked singularity solutions, which which just uh, turn up as soon as you add a small scalar field. So what is the well again? It, it's a sort of so the statement is if you if you really have a small perturbation of Schwarzschild and Schwarzschild, then no, you will not get those such you will not get things in particular. Okay. Yes. The statement about the stability is the full space time, or is the space time say on um, certain horizons or surfaces? And very good question. So this is all about the exterior. 
So up, up, up to and including the horizon. And if you want to go a little bit in the horizon, that's sort of easy once you, you're at the horizon. Okay? But certainly the, what happens in the interior is another story, which we can another talk. All right. So, um, so right, I, I, I should say one thing about the nonlinear aspects of this problem. The, um, of course, I, I said that ideally one wants, I guess in answer to your question, one would want sort of a very a black box theorem. You know, you have sufficiently strong linear stability, you have nonlinear stability. You know, there, there are such theorems, for instance, in the world of ODEs. Okay. It'd be great if, if, if we have that. Um, but it turns out that there is a one nonlinear aspect in, in all these problems, which is that the nonlinear terms in the Einstein equations, they have to be cooperative, they have to be good. So that, that's a statement actually about the Einstein equations, really. It's not really a statement about any particular solution. And remarkably, this, this is true. But the nonlinear terms are not as bad as they could have been. And this is, uh, you know, this is a, a long story in itself, but it's sort of an old story. So I'm not going to talk about it more. So this, this whole, you know, fact that yes, in principle, if you, if you have linear stability for this business, you can, you can hope to show nonlinear stability by just, you know, usual techniques is, is predicated on that. Okay. Um, and there are many technical issues, which again, hopefully one day we'll have a better way of dealing. Okay. So, um, so I'll come back to the statement, the Schwarzschild statement, because it will be um, uh, useful later on. Uh, let me say a little bit about further developments. Um, so, um, so what about um, perturbing Schwarzschild very, 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 very slightly in the curve boundary? So looking at uh, the modulus of A much, much smaller than M. Um, so it turns out that you really can, you know, handle this perturbatively from Schwarzschild once you understand Schwarzschild. Uh, so in particular, the, the linear theory was, was unlocked actually in two independent works, uh, one of myself and uh, Rodnyansky and another of C. Yuan Ma. Um, and there's been uh, further work uh, on the full linear theory. So these papers were just engaged in very quantities. Um, and there are recent papers of um, various people on the nonlinear problem also. Uh, but, uh, but of course, what we're really interested in is not perturbing Schwarzschild, but actually Kerr in its, in its full uh, sub-extremal uh, glory. And it's really here that the, the Kerr difficulties start playing a role. And in particular, um, uh, what you mentioned, namely sort of superradiance. In some sense, in the very slowly rotating case, superradiance, you can think of it as a very small parameter and you can absorb it somehow. Um, you can actually absorb it using the strength of the redshift, uh, partly because the, the ergo region sort of in physical space is located very close to the horizon. Um, so it's really only in the in this case where you know that's a that's a problem. And um, and so um, so this was unlocked in a in a series of papers which show definitive results about the Tukolsky equation. The Tukolsky equation parameterizes the gauge invariant degrees of freedom in the problem. So these are papers by the Schapino, Rothman, and Rita Teixeira da Costa. Uh, and there's also some uh, work of Millet. And in view of this and a bunch of other stuff that have been done, one can really hope for a write-up of a complete proof of nonlinear stability of the actual Kerr family in all its sub-extremal glory in the near future. Okay, I don't want to talk more about sub-extremal Kerr because what I'm really interested in this talk is about extramality, about the case A equals M. And um, needless to say, uh, all the techniques that sort of went into this, for instance, this work here, um, sometimes everything breaks down as you approach extramality, essentially. So, um, so it's very much a sense that whatever is being done here does not, uh, so even if you didn't know anything else, you just looked at these works, sort of extramality is different. Okay, so, um, so what about extramality? How, how have, people thought about extremality. Um, so when I, I, I claim is that there have been sort of two dominant paradigms that have um, sort of, uh, determined the language that we talk about extremality. So the first paradigm is what I'll call the, the third law paradigm. So this uh, originates in this um, seminal paper of Bardeen, Carter and Hawking from 1973, the four laws of, of black hole mechanics. Um, so this, uh, first sort of suggested um, a sort of dictionary between the laws of um, classical thermodynamics and the laws of black hole mechanics. Um, 
And, um, well, I'm not going to talk about full dictionary, which is very familiar to many members of this audience. So I'm, I'm, I'm only going to talk about the, the last of the four laws, which is confusingly called the third law. Um, and, um, and so this third law is, again, in analogy with the, 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 the third law of uh, classical thermodynamics, one of the formulations of which is that you cannot achieve absolute zero in some finite physical process. So the, uh, the analogy applied to black hole mechanics was that it should be impossible by any procedure, no matter how idealized, to reduce kappa, kappa is the surface gravity, thing that's analogous to temperature, to zero by a finite sequence of operations. And again, you are to remember that extremal curve is exactly the case kappa equals zero. So, um, so one caricature of this paradigm is the statement that extremal black holes are physically inaccessible, ideal limit. That's, that's how you should think about it. Something that it's an ideal limit, but you cannot physically ever access it. Okay, so, um, so actually this, um, this uh, quote, which is from that uh, paper of Bardeen, Carter, and Hawking, uh, will be very relevant because it transitions to the second paradigm. So actually they write, at the, towards the end of the paper. Another reason for believing the third law is that if one could reduce kappa to zero by a finite sequence of operations, then presumably one could carry the process further, thereby creating a naked singularity. If this were to happen, there would be a breakdown of the assumption of asymptotic predictability, which is the basis of many results in black hole theory, including the law that A cannot decrease. That sense makes sense. Well, that's... Uh, <laughs> I didn't write it. That, I it's like saying you could take, you could take it to... If you had a thermodynamic system and you could find a way to get it to zero temperature, you could continue at the negative temperature. <laughs> it's the same statement. That's what I'm just quoting. That's what I'm doing. Okay, but it does bring us to the second uh, paradigm, which in some sense is even more pernicious, which is the overspinning supercharging paradigm. So, um, so the uh, sort of uh, the person who unwillingly gave rise to this paradigm is, is Bob Walt. And I say unwillingly because as, as you'll see, he, 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 he gave evidence for the fact that this is not correct. So, um, so basically uh, the, this, this, this paradigm is, okay, I have an extremal black hole, extremal black hole, I try to throw in some more charge or some more uh, spin, okay? Uh, it becomes super extremal. Super extremal means naked singularity. So extremal black holes are a gateway to naked singularities. So, um, so this whole story, of course, it, it originates from this, this beautiful paper of, of Bob Walt, where he showed that you couldn't do this in the sort of test particle approximation, essentially. Um, and it, it's, you know, make, make no mistake that this is, you know, this is what he concludes. Thus, we have attempted to produce a contradiction to the conjectures on gravitational collapse described in section one, uh, but electrostatic centrifugal spin spin repulsion effects have all conspired to make the Gedanken experiments of section two and section three fail. This failure may increase one's confidence in the validity of the gravitational collapse conjectures. So, in any case, so he, on the basis of the sort of test particle approximation, uh, he sort of uh, convinced himself that you cannot overspin or supercharge, um, but that doesn't mean that there have not been hundreds of papers uh, subsequently, which uh, attempt to overspin or supercharge black holes. So wait a few weeks on the archive, we'll see a few. So there are more and more and more. Okay, so, and somehow I, I claim to you that these two paradigms, the one is that you cannot even achieve extremality, the third law paradigm, and the other that, um, it's, it's interesting that these two paradigms are contradictory, but this is actually never discussed in any of the relevant papers that subscribe to one or the other. But in any case, the other paradigm that says that, yeah, you can, you can achieve uh, extremality. In fact, you can, you, you can supercharge and create naked singularities. These sort of have uh, sort of uh, taken all the oxygen out of discussion of extremal black hole. Okay, so, um, so what about these paradigms? So first of all, the third law, it's out the window. It's completely false. So this is a recent paper of Kayla and uh, Unger. Uh, so let me just tell you the theorem. Uh, the theorem is that sub-extremal black holes can become extremal in finite time, evolving from regular initial data. Um, and in fact, you can even do this in, in gravitational collapse. Let's say you can start with 
completely impeccable in Ishudoda, one ended, and no trap surface is nothing whatsoever. Uh, trap surfaces form. So you have an initially sub-extremal phase to your black hole. And then at some later advanced time, uh, the black hole is exactly extreme. Uh, so this has been uh, accomplished in the context of the Einstein Maxwell charge scalar field uh, uh, system where the sort of the notion of extremal black hole is um, extremal Reister and Hallstrom. Um, but I should say that they, they also conjecture, and this would be very interesting to prove, that you can do this in vacuum. So what I mean is you can have a one-ended vacuum initial data, which collapses to form uh, uh, a, a black hole, which is, let's say, maybe Schwarzschild uh, for some period. Okay? And then after some uh, finite advanced time is exactly extreme occur in, in a neighborhood of us. Yes? What spins it out? Gravitational waves. This is a, this in principle, a pure vacuum. So no astrophysics. <laughs> okay, no astrophysics. Okay. Yeah, no astrophysics. So of course, it's it's very interesting in this context. I mean, to revisit things like the thorn bound, I mean, things, things that involve truly astrophysical processes for spinning up a black hole. But if you believe this conjecture, the claim is that in principle, this, this can happen in pure vacuum by just the gravitational waves. I, I'm an astrophysicist, so I, know. I have to ask this question. So what generates the gravitational waves? Well, so what, what you could think is that, okay, you could even, if, if you want, because, okay, what, what is Cauchy data after all, you can think of this as, as um, uh, arising from past gathering data. So there's some gravitational waves that are coming from very far away from something, and you know they conspire to do this. That would be the you know. anyway. That it's not proven. It's it's but, but, it's a but, all, but all of this is in the vacuum. So this would be completely separate from accretion. Difference. This would be completely separate from accretion. And again, I think it would be very interesting to revisit some of that literature in view of this. I I don't have you know I don't have any insight on that, but things like the thorn down and things that sort of suggest that, you know, there are astrophysical processes that sort of, you know, prevent you from achieving astronomy. Uh, I, 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 would, I would look at that, <laughs> yes. but I'm not an expert. Let me ask one thing. Yeah. If you can spin it up to extremality with gravitational waves, yeah. you could, in theory, spin it up with more astrophysical processes also to extremality. Yes. Yes. I mean, there, there certainly is no it's a conceptual reason, a priori. So, yeah, but, okay. Is it, but let's see, the, the charge Vigia solutions with, with a null fluid would, would be a really simple counterexample. They right? don't though, it's, it's very interesting, the literature. And uh, the, actually this is addressed in the upcoming paper of Kaylin. Wait, because I get, this is a homework problem. Well, you, 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 <laughs> wait, you say they don't? Well, you, you, you should see this paper and there's a very, I mean, you'll see why. I mean, the problem with, with the sort of traditional interpretation of charge vibia, yeah. and this is actually, this is discussed in Israel's paper on the third law, right. and this is exactly why he rejects right. the thing, is the sort of the traditional interpretation of the charge vibia uh, solution. Yeah. It violates the energy conditions. Um, but of course, there, there, there's another thing you can do, and that's uh, sort of this mo model of Ori with a bounce. And, and uh, well, you'll, you'll see this treated in, in, in Kayla and Unger's upcoming paper. I see. So this charge scalar field has some better energy condition. So charge scalar field, this is an impeccable form. Okay. Um, so I claim to you that the supercharging paradigm is also false. Um, and uh, uh, But to see this, we, we, we have to understand better the dynamics in the neighborhood of extreme black holes. Um, and for this, I guess we have to... Um, uh, so this is the next uh, topic in the, in, in the course. So for this, we have to go back to Schwarzschild to the theorem I started with, and I'm going to actually state the theorem uh, in a slightly more precise way, because this is exactly the kind of statement that we might want to try to make in the extreme case. Okay, so here's a more precise statement of the, the nonlinear asymptotic stability of Schwarzschild in the full co-dimension. So uh, the same as the following. So, okay, you don't lose any, of course, you might like, Cauchy data, but we know very well how to go from Cauchy data to sort of a bifurcate null hypersurface. So this is an outgoing null hypersurface that goes to null infinity, and this is an ingoing uh, horizon penetrating um, 
null uh, hypersurface. So actually, you can sort of start the problem here. So you, you, know, you have Schwarzschild initial data here that leads to Schwarzschild, and I'm going to wiggle the data ever so slightly. That's my perturbed data. And more generally, I'm going to think of the moduli space of all data close to Schwarzschild. So that's what I'll, I'll call uh, math frac M. So every time you see math frac, of course, scary, scary, scary. Um, <laughs> that's a, you know, an infinite dimensional space. No one wants to think about it, but it's still useful to have the language, even if okay, who knows exactly how to define it. Okay. So the statement is the following. Um, the, so there is a, a co-dimension three submanifold. And again, let me not say why it's co-dimension three and not co-dimension one. This just has to do with the fact that Schwarzschild has extra symmetry with respect to curves. So it's, it's the way you see the moduli space. Anyway, there's a co-dimension three submanifold, which I'll call M stable, of the moduli space of initial data. Okay. So that if, if you're on that submanifold, then uh, the following things are true. Uh, the, the development of initial data, it's sort of Penrose diagram, if you, if you will, looks exactly like this. So you, you, know, you have a complete future null infinity, you have a regular uh, event horizon, um, and moreover, the solution asymptotes inverse polynomially to uh, some nearby Schwarzschild metric um, uh, as you go in this direction. Okay, so this captures exactly the space times that, that asymptote back to a member of, of the Schwarzschild family. Is that an asymptotically null or asymptotically space-like surface? This is null. This so was sigma is oh this this was let's say a Cauchy. This is an asymptotically flat Cauchy hypers. I'm just saying that okay, you can always go from here to here. Okay, so I'm going to forget this and I'm going to start the problem there. If you want, you can you know right. the, this statement means an analogous statement holds where your dot is on sigma. Right. Okay, but it's sort of cleaner to sort of parameterize data on on null hypersurfaces because of the nature of the constraints. Constraints are actually easier to sort of take. So, is uh, it complicated where the two null surfaces meet or, or is that? No, this is a sphere. Yeah. Okay. So, so the question is, could a similar statement hold for extremal black holes? Okay, that's the question. Okay, so, um, so before addressing that question, there's, there's a little problem, which is that it's, it's been known uh, for the, the last 10 years, that there is a certain instability associated with uh, extremal black holes that sort of, you, you already see in sort of, when you look at the scalar wave equation, in fact, on a fixed extremal black hole. So this has nothing to do with modulation of parameters, by the way. This is a genuine instability of, you know, the extremal case. Um, and the, the instability is funny because it, it sort of, it only operates on the horizon. So that's to say, um, uh, what happens because of this instability is that if you look at sort of um, translation invariant transversal derivatives of uh, physical quantities along the horizon, these fail to decay. And in fact, sort of the higher order ones, they blow up. So they, they increase without bound polynomial in time. Um, so this is in contrast to the sub-extremal case. In the sub-extremal case, it doesn't matter how much you differentiate your fields, everything decays polynomially everywhere, including along the horizon, in fact, even a little bit in space. Okay, so, so there's some sort of instability. Um, now, um, in the, in the Reisner-Nordstrom extremal case, so the baby extremal case uh, with, with charge, uh, it turns out that one can prove that this instability is weak. So what I mean is that yes, okay, some derivatives they blow up, but if you look away from the horizon, everything does decay. And well, okay, certain things blow up on the horizon, but okay, you can understand exactly the sharp behavior on the horizon. There's certain other quantities that actually decay. So, uh, so in this context, in the context of uh, sort of linear uh, gravitational and electromagnetic perturbations of extremal resonance, so this has been shown by um, uh, a student of Stefan's, uh, that is uh, Marius Petroae. Uh, and okay, this is the statement of the theorem, but you don't have to look at it. So, okay, so there's some instability that makes the problem harder, but it's, it's weak. So in some sense, from a more coarse grain point of view, you have stability. If you don't look at high derivatives, you have stability. So you could still hope that stability survives in the nonlinear theory, but okay, it's tricky. So actually, things get much worse for Kern, because 
incur, you actually have worse instabilities on the horizon, um, which uh, are um, have been dubbed azimuthal instabilities. So they're instabilities for higher azimuthal modes um, that are stronger than the uh, Aridagis instability. And so this actually really has to do with um, somehow the merger of the difficulty of super radiance and, and trapping as, as you uh, approach externality. So there's no analog of this, let's say, in the Reisner Nordstrom. But it, in the Reisner Nordstrom case, you don't if have you this. had, but if you had things with fields with sort of charge greater than mass, you, would, you wouldn't get something similar? That may be the case. Yeah, that, is, that may be the case. Yeah. So I'm, I'm certainly not looking at that. Right. It would be interesting, actually, to look at that. Okay, so um, so actually, uh, you might ask, so do we do we have some weaker stability for extremal curve? And it's really uh, interesting, and this uh, goes to show that there are still <laughs> very fundamental linear questions that we don't understand. So there is no, let's say, positive stability statement for extremal curve outside of axis symmetry, even for the linear wave equation. So the best statement available is so-called mode stability due to Rita to share the question. But, um, but even the most basic statement is, this is the linear wave equation. So forget gravitational perturbation. This is the linear wave equation, simplest model for a linear equation on sub-extremal curve. Do solutions of this equation remain bounded for all time outside of the black hole and far away from the horizon? We don't know the answer to that. Okay. Wait, so, wait a second. I thought mode stability for Kerr was was so, proven decades ago. So right? mode stability for the sub-extremal case was shown by Whiting. Yeah. But his proof, and it's a brilliant proof, uh, and it doesn't work in the extremal case. So the first uh, result in the extremal case is, is due to beta. So I see. It breaks, I mean, the proof does, it, it genuinely breaks down. And you have to do something different. And she does something different. Right. Yeah. But in the end, you just it's again. I mean, this, and Fourier transform and so this is again. Plus. So this is just finally. I mean, this is a statement about confluent point equations. So this is right. really an ODE statement, right? Uh, but it's a tricky one. I see. Interesting. Okay. So um, so because of that, so in the paper uh, with uh, Holtzigl, Brodniansky, and Taylor, where we proved the, the stability, the nonlinear stability of Schwarzschild, we made a conjecture about the extremal case. But exactly because of this uh, situation that, you know, in the, okay, in the Reiser Nordstrom case, uh, we were confident that there is a weak stability. In the Kerr case, you know, we, you know, we, we weren't. We only made a conjecture in, in the, you know, for the Einstein Maxwell system around um, uh, Reiser Nordstrom because we were timid. But I'm not going to be timid in front of Andy. So I'm going to modify. Uh, I mean, we said, of course, one can already conjecture the analog. For extremal curve, um, but okay, we were timid, but I won't be timid, and I'm just going to change the conjecture to refer to <laughs> extremal curve, and it's also easier to talk about because the numerology. So, okay, but you, you can see what I changed. Um, so the, the the analog of the conjecture for extremal curve would be the following. Okay, so this is a picture, let's say, of extremal curve. Okay, and again, think of extremal curve as arising from, uh, well, instead of Cauchy delta, as arising from. Uh, bifurcate null initial delta. And again, I have an outgoing cone that goes out to null infinity. And then I have an ingoing cone and I stop somewhere inside the, um, the black hole. Okay? And I'm just looking at the, the domain of dependence of this. Okay? So remember, this is finite. Okay? This is finite. Right. So, um, so, okay, so one choice of initial data is extremal curve. Uh, and of course, you have Nearby, you have sub-extremal and super-extremal, okay? Um, but the statement is the following, that in the whole moduli space of all nearby data, okay, there is a co-dimension one sub-manifold, which I call M-stable, okay? Such that um, if you're on that sub-manifold, the Penrose diagram looks like this, again, and you will approach extremal curve, okay? So, um, Moreover, because we have to pay lip service to the Aritaikis and these more recent azimuthal instabilities, um, for the generic solution on that co-dimension one 
hypersurface, so generic condition to being on the co-dimensional hypersurface, um, you'll have this uh, sort of, you can think of this as sort of hair. Uh, you'll have these higher order quantities uh, that don't decay along the horizon. They, they actually grow, but the geometry itself is still going to extremely curved. Okay, so, so that, that's the conjecture. So, um, so let me make uh, some comments. So let's say we believe the conjecture because, okay, you know, shouldn't, you know, we mathematicians can go down and spend the next 50 years trying to prove that conjecture, but okay, you don't want to wait for us. So let's believe the conjecture. Here in the black hole edition. Yeah. Okay, so, um, um, so the conjecture again is that for extremal curve, around extremal curve, there exists a co dimension one sub manifold of moduli space of solutions that asymptotic back to extremal curve. So, um, so what does this sub manifold of moduli space separate? And, uh, and we say this again in, 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 in the paper. I mean, again, the conversation here was for Rice and Nordstrom, but I just changed it to Kerr. Um, so one could hope to prove that this submanifold delimits the boundary, signifying a phase transition between two very different open regions of the moduli space, namely the set of delta leading to space times failing to collapse, and the set of delta leading to a black hole exterior settling down to a subextremal. So here's a little picture. Okay. So I'm looking now at just the moduli space of space times evolving from this. And you should always remember that this ingoing null cone is, is incomplete, okay? So, so the claim is that, so this is the moduli space, it's infinite dimensional, but okay. Even at Harvard, your boards are only finite dimension. Um, and so this is <laughs> co-dimension one, okay? This is the co-dimension one thing, but you should think that it separates the moduli space into space times that collapse to a sub-extremal black hole. So if you're here, then there'll be a horizon there. And moreover, you'll asymptote as you go here to a sub-extremal black hole nearby to extremality. Mm -hmm. But if you're here, then it's very simple. You're just not going to collapse in time. So what I mean is that, well, null infinity will go up to here. Okay. And oh, well, my 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 data ended. Okay. So I'll have an incomplete null infinity, but the the, the this boundary will be null infinity. So it, it didn't have time to collapse in the time you allotted it. Yeah. All right. So so this is this is the picture. Um, so if you imagine that that your moduli space that they could potentially lead to more possibilities than these, like for example, generating naked singularities. That's so in a neighborhood of extremal current, the, the, the claim is this is the moduli space. That, that, that's what I believe. What else could have happened? I mean, obviously some some data will not collapse, and well, obviously if, some will collapse. And doesn't the boundary have to be extreme? If you believe, if you believe in this overspinning supercharging paradigm, then you should also be seeing no naked singularities here, because that's sort of what they all try. They all trying to perturb uh, a, a subextremal black hole. And create naked singularities. So, in particular, Wait, but let me say one other thing. Let me say one other thing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, moreover, there's there's a sufficient condition I claim to lie on the right hand side because, of course, uh, you know, in general, uh, whether you lie, let's say I have initial data. In general, I don't know if I lie here or there. It's a teleologically determined moduli space. Okay. It's only when I know the final parameters. But there is a sufficient condition I claim. Sufficient, not necessary, that, that I lie on the, the right hand side. And that is that there is a trapped or marginally trapped surface in the initial data. And in fact, in all the supercharging, super extremal literature, they start with a sub extremal black hole, very near extremality. They do a small process, which is supposed to make this, make a naked singularity. So, this, if, if you believe this conjecture, this conjecture tells you that. You know, the initial data they consider will lead you here, necessarily. So, uh, so in particular, a corollary of this is that overspinning supercharging paradigm is, is also false. Let's see, so the, the third law would be stronger than cosmic censorship, right? It's not stronger in the sense it doesn't imply cosmic censorship. No, but the cosmic censorship doesn't 
imply. I, yeah, I mean, I, my, my plan is if that. If you assume cosmic censorship, doesn't this boundary argument almost say that the third law has to be wrong? What else could lie there? No, it doesn't. There's nothing. There's nothing inconsistent with certain. I mean, it depends what you mean. I mean, if 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 that, that's to say, okay, if, if so, there's a let's say there's a stronger version of the third law, which you might have thought, which said that not only could you not achieve extremality in finite time, yeah. but you cannot asymptotically achieve extremality. And indeed, sort of okay, this statement uh, would falsify that stronger version of the third law. Because okay, th these would be such solutions, yeah. um, and indeed, uh, sort of, it's it's very hard to reconcile. Uh, what uh, I don't know, what it's very hard to reconcile what the marginalized space would look like if, if something like that stronger version of the third law <laughs> were true. But okay, I, yeah, that, yeah, that's what yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. true. Okay, didn't prevent people from. All right, so finally, in the last uh, zero minutes that I don't have, I do want to say uh, maybe the most uh, interesting uh, uh, thing that comes out of this, which is um, this new uh, picture of extremo critical collapse um, and this uh, new picture of, of phase space. So the phase space that I've drawn for you uh, is a little bit unfortunate because I'm, I'm looking at initial data that is incomplete. So what this means is that this phase space does not actually reflect the the final history of these space times. Okay, so these space times, sure, this space space tells you because, okay, at least if you only care about the exterior, the exterior is completely contained in the domain of dependence of this initial dot. But that's not the case for these. Okay, because what's happening here is exactly that, well, the space time didn't collapse in time, and I've run out of data. So I don't know what happens if I don't tell you more data. Okay, so. Um, Okay, so so what's this new picture of extremal critical collapse? So, uh, so of course the the story of critical collapse in general relativity is an old one. This is very beautiful paper, survey paper of of Karsten Gundlach and uh, Jose Martin uh, Garcia. Um, and in this paper, you'll see this picture that's very very uh, often drawn in in, in talks about um, critical collapse. And the picture is the following. So we all know that flat space is solution. The Einstein vacuum equations or Einstein scalar field or your favorite sort of matter model. Okay. And of course, flat space, well, the solution disperses. No black holes in particular. And we also know that flat space is stable, in, in fact, even non-linearly, in fact, even say for vacuum perturbations without any symmetry. This is uh, celebrated theorem of Crystal Zulu and, and Clara. Um, so you know, near here in moduli space, the solutions also disperse. Okay. Well, we also know that if, if fields are large enough, then black holes can form. Right? Again, even just for vacuum, but also easier to show for Einstein scalar field. So let's imagine, okay, I have a you know, Minkowski space, which disperses, and my favorite black hole forming solution. And I connect them by a one parameter family moduli space of, of sort of solutions. Okay. Um, let me try to find the the first solution, which, which doesn't disperse, okay? So I, I, I call that my, my, my critical solution, okay? And, um, well, Chuptuic famously uh, showed numerically, at least, that for the Einstein scalar field um, uh, system, then, you know, those critical solutions are naked singularities. Um, and, um, in fact, you have various universal behavior near them that I don't want to talk about at all. But in any case, you should think that in, in, the, in the picture people had in mind, these sort of critical solutions form a co-dimension one hypersurface in moduli space. Okay. So let me redraw this picture the way I want to draw the picture, okay? because this will be easier to compare. So this is my picture of moduli space of gravitational collapse. So in the very center is Minkowski space that disperses. And we know there's a neighborhood in moduli space around Minkowski space that also disperse. We also know that they're the, the, the space times that collapse to form a black hole, okay? And well, this is this one parameter interpolating family, okay, that Chuptuic studied uh, numerically, and he found the critical solution, which was a naked singularity. And the sort of the expectation is that, well, there's a one parameter, uh, there's a sort of co-dimension one hypersurface in moduli space 
of critical naked singularities um, that sort of form the boundary of the collapse into black hole solutions and the dispersion solution. So that's the um, that's sort of the picture that people have in mind. And of course, okay, as long as this is co-dimension one, then these naked singularities are non-generic. So this is still compatible with cosmic censorship, but it sort of tells you that cosmic censorship better indeed sort of uh, impose genericity. Okay. So this is the traditional. So do you say everywhere in this boundary, you have an infinitesimally small black hole, right? Well, you have a naked singularity and you can think of it as a, as a limit of black holes yeah, yeah. Going just, out just in the boundary, it's an infinitesimal small. You can think of it like that if you want. Okay, so here's uh, here's the theorem of uh, uh, Kalen uh, Unger, which uh, I understand will appear this week on the archive. So, uh, so the theorem says that well, uh, it's not just naked singularities, but extremal black holes also occur at the threshold of black hole formation. Uh, that's to say there, there exist one Gramlin families of initial data, and they, they look at an impeccable system. Um, so they look at the, the Einstein-Maxwell charged Vlasov system. Um, so for, for this system, you can find uh, one Gramlin family of initial data, which interpolates between collapse, uh, between, sorry, dispersion, saying it the other way that I wrote it, and collapse, okay, um, where the critical solution, okay, is... Uh, uh, a space time which collapses to an extremal rise of relativity. So, um, so what this suggests is that the, the, the correct picture of the moduli space of gravitational collapse is something a little more complicated, is something like this. So yes, you have a sort of a region of the boundary of the dispersive region, which let's say is these critical naked singularities, okay? But, you know, if if you know where to go, and there's a reason I actually drew it look like this, but anyway, I can talk about that later. There's another region of the boundary, all right, where the critical solutions are not uh, uh, critical naked singularities, but there are critical extremal black holes. So, uh, so these black holes are very interesting because their very black holeness is unstable. You know, if you have a sub-extreme of black hole, you perturb. Okay, the parameters will change, but it, it's, it's black holeness is stable. But these, these solutions here, if you perturb a little bit there, they disperse. So, um, so I should say that not all extremal black holes are critical extremal black holes. So you should think that there are non-critical extremal black holes that you know, may look like this in the moduli space. And in fact, if you think about the partial moduli space that I drew, Previously, okay, you can think about it as sort of these are two different snapshots of that moduli space. So this is the case where the, you know, genuinely the, the other space times dispersed. And this is the case where, you know, on one side of the boundary, the space times collapsed later. Okay, so it's funny because this means that there is a discontinuity of the parameters across this boundary. Okay, but it's completely contained in the black hole region. So, um, um, and finally, I should say that um, there are also, in principle, non-critical naked singularities. So, naked singularities that look like this. In fact, naked singularities that maybe have, you know, have smaller co-dimension than a larger co-dimension than one. So, I've drawn them like this. So, this is uh, the revised picture of the moduli space of gravitational collapse that sort of, uh, comes out from thinking. Uh, I think better about what, what the extremal limit is all about. Okay, uh, sorry for being late and sorry for going over. That was great, thanks. Okay, thanks for the great talk. In view of time, maybe we can take two to three questions. So this is all again in the vacuum. How dependent are these theorems on being in a vacuum, because we, we see black holes that exist ever physically. Uh, is it, what, what is your comment on the stability of these black holes that, that we know do not exist? Well, I mean, sort of the, I mean, I, I think the right interpretation of all this is that all this happens already in the vacuum. I mean, that's sort of, the, you know, you already have this in the vacuum. Uh, so, okay, so, you know, I, I 
you know, I mean, okay, as you know much better than uh, I do, astrophysics is complicated and dirty. So, you know, it's it's hard to get you know clean statements, you know, of this type in general in 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 you know in a more astrophysical context. But you know, as a matter of principle, I, I don't know anything that sort of would say that fundamentally this picture would be different if you you know include you know a bunch of other matter fields that are supposed to somehow uh, model astrophysical relevant uh, processes. You know, conversely, if if they did, that would be very interesting because it sort of would be saying that you know astrophysics is preventing certain kinds of behavior that otherwise, for pure vacuum general relativity, would be natural. So and, that, and that that maybe another way of saying it is that it could be observed something that would comment on the stability. Well I certainly think that you know in principle in principle this where is the that box? No this box you in principle you could observe this part of modules. I mean again it, it is predicate on on you know astrophysics also allowing this. Okay but in principle you know, and, and all these interesting phenomena that you do see near extremal black holes, for instance, the actual weak instabilities, you know, like, like this aritaxis instability and these sort of maybe worse instabilities, in principle, those are the things that you could see. So my appeal to people is if we start talking about supercharging and overspinning and third law and things that are just, they're not true and they're not helpful, and focus on, you know, there, there are actual questions. I mean, you know, this is a very well-defined conjectural picture. And there are actual questions that you can, you know. And yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe this conjecture is false in vacuum. Maybe it's true in vacuum and false ast astrophysically for some very interesting reason. And all those are nice questions to entertain. But I really think that somehow, and, and this is, very, by the way, a very, simple picture and it's not a, you know, it, it's strange that be, because in my view, the oxygen has been taken by sort of things that have nothing to do with what's going on in the modular space. You know, we don't focus on, on you know. So anyway, I like this picture. I think this is, I, I would bet on this picture, but that's all I can say. And for the second red line that is the rest in the Nordstrom case, you don't think that there can be two extremal black hole solutions? Oh, well, I mean, certainly, okay, you can, you know, I, in, in that sense, I mean, this is, uh, yeah, I mean, sure. But, you know, what's interesting, for instance, let's say, a, a simpler, so a much simpler example than vacuum gravitation collapse without symmetry is, okay, take your favorite, you know, charge scalar field, spherically symmetric. So you still have extremality, the charged case, you know? This is again, it, it, it has, it, it, it should have at least this complexity. So this should be the picture. And what's very interesting is that people have numerically studied that system and they, they numerically tried to produce near extremal black holes. They, they failed and well, they said, well, that's great, uh, third law. So in fact, they even claimed that there's a threshold away from extremality, if, uh, which is bizarre, that, they, that, you, that could you could achieve. never do it on a computer, right? Which, which well, mm -hmm. but, um, but one reason that I, I drew this thing to curve like this is that, you know, it, 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 it may very well be that if you, if you really start with a, your favorite profile, and try to scale it up so you go out radially, you'll always hit, you know, the, the sort of choptuic like uh -huh. naked singularities. And so it may be that you, you, better, you have to go like this in order to hit the, uh, so you, you, you need to know that this passage is there. Let's put it like this. If, if, if you're naive, you might not see it. Okay, so it's good that, uh, Kayla and Unger have shown us that this passage does exist. It must exist or it can exist. It does. They, they, they you know, in, in the context of uh, this Einstein Vlasov, so Einstein Maxwell charged Vlasov. Um, would also be nice to show it for, let's say, charge scalar field. It's just more difficult to do mathematically because 
because it's sort of a more un unwieldy model. You can One last it. question. Yes. So, uh, is this sort of uh, thing also possible for spinning so the spinning? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the claim is that for let's say the vacuum, Einstein vacuum. This is so everything is gravitation. This collapse is just the gravitational waves. This is also possible in principle. This would be my bet, and so these would be extremal Kerr solutions, which are at the boundary of the you know. So again, what you should think is that this is a one parameter family. So these are you know gravitational waves that eventually disperse, okay, uh, and. Uh, so the, and this critical solution is you collapse to an exactly extremal curve, and then here you collapse to the sub extreme. So is there like a toy model example of a critical? Uh, well, the toy model is what they did. No, but I mean, but in curve, like a critical naked singularity, which is, uh, say, a curve naked singularity. I mean, and so I would not use the word naked. There's nothing, there are no naked singularities. No, these are not naked singularities. No, I mean, even this bit, in this direction. In this direction. Yeah. Uh, well, so there are, if you want, there are vacuum examples now of naked singularities, mm -hmm. um, which have been um, uh, pure, Einstein. pure Einstein. So this is actually Rodniansky and Schlappenthal Rothman. Mm -hmm. um, but what's interesting is that, um, like previous examples for the Einstein scalar field that were constructed by Sothulu, um, these, these examples live here. So, um, so there are known examples of uh, naked singularities, but there is no, um, we don't know how to sort of prove rigorously that there are, even for Einstein scalar field, where there are numerical examples, we don't know how to show that uh, those examples do indeed live, or some other example that we can cook up by our own techniques lives here. Um, but they're all sort of weak naked singularities of some kind, right? Well, I mean, in some sense, they're weak, but it's strong. It's they're happily non generic. But Chris, you know those examples that the no energy could come out, or they... well, I mean, again, those, those examples are very different, I should say. I mean, I think if this is. I mean, even for Einstein scalar, so for the Einstein scalar field system in spherical symmetry, uh, there is no this because there's no there's nothing that can act like charge. So the picture then, in principle, we we'd, we'd like to show this picture, Einstein scalar field in spherical symmetry. Um, so it's sort of it's funny. One can show in that case that you know the black hole region in moduli space is open. That's actually easy to show. So black holes are stable, if you want in, in that model. That's that's actually quite easy to show. Um, but um, so you might ask, okay, well, what what could then be on this boundary other than a naked singularity? It can't be a black hole. You don't have extremal black holes, which can be on the boundary as we just showed. But so the only thing it could be, you might think, is a naked singularity. But actually, uh, what can be on the boundary a priori is a is a dispersive solution that doesn't disperse too fast. Because you know, if a solution disperses fast enough, one can again show that it, a neighborhood of solutions will also disperse. So, so a very interesting open problem in this business is, is to show that indeed, you know, there are, you know, well, either there are no such fully dispersing uh, solutions on the boundary, that's to say everything on the boundary is, is a naked singularity, or maybe there, there are, in which case, okay, again, there's a, there's another aspect to this picture that we want to understand. Okay, let's leave further questions. I'll try with the second Thanks again. Thanks. Uh,